I'm here with a very dear friend of mine, Pralat Kakkar. He calls himself the mad ad man. I think he's not a mad ad man. He is a mad man in life. <laughs> if you read his wonderful book, you'll find that advertising was a longer period in his life. But apart from that, he's done some wonderful things like scuba diving, like selling cigars, like starting a restaurant, starting movie scenario to teach people. So the list is endless. And uh, I would urge you to read this book to really understand him. I know him so well. And I know the language he normally uses, which he can't use in a book. <laughs> so I'll, let me leave it to Prahlad to explain to you <coughs> what was his intent. Tell me a little bit about uh, yeah, your life yeah. in, in, in slightly concise fashion because otherwise they'll have nothing to read. No, you see what happened was that Mitali decided that, Bhaiya, uh, now you teaching, you're doing this, you're doing that. You need to get to a larger audience. I'm sure she didn't say Bhaiya to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, she said, uh, you must get to a larger audience and therefore you must write your professional uh, career, at least uh, in advertising, so that um, a lot of young people who, uh, in the future, who will come into the business, where it will have changed to such an extent that they will not recognize it for the animal that it is. That then they can go back and turn around and say, SB hua karta tha. You know, it used to be like this as well. And that's and why I said, Prahlad, that... Yeah. So, um, uh, she got on to me, like, uh, Covid aya. So, <laughs> she said, you, you don't have any issues now, you can't say I'm busy. So, she, uh, hunter wali, you know, it's a <laughs> total, and got on to my case and uh, made me write. So then I realized that my professional uh, career in advertising or in scuba diving and whatever was actually uh, a re reflection of my growing up. And in our various careers, yours as well as mine, a lot of your growing up period has influenced your writing and your thinking to a very large extent. Absolutely. So, if I left that part out, then it would be limbo. So, I would, then people think, oh, he's a genius. Where did he get these ideas from? Not just a genius, people will think that you're a man who goes by the book. A yeah. number of people have written yeah. books for the sake of writing a book. Correct. You have written this book from the heart yes. and expressing, where did you learn it from? Yes. Why did you express it this way? So, life is a, is, is the classroom. True. And uh, my earliest memories were for, since I was f uh, f uh, four to five years old, where I was thrown out of play school. And I, <laughs> I know that story. And I continue to uh, be thrown out of various institutions of, you know, great repute. Until I started realizing that it was much more fun being thrown out than being a part of it. You know? <laughs> so then I used to engineer being thrown out. But the fact was that this whole business of chedoing, you know, teasing uh, the establishment to react, because the establishment is a monolith. It consists of suits. Yeah. It consists of people who uh, come in a framework. Who, uh, they, they don't step out of the framework, they, no. they have a rule book and they have terms of engagement. And the fact is that life throws everything at you. There are no terms of engagement. You take it as it comes and you respond uh, to the best of your ability, either through fear or through bravado or through uh, challenge. Uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, in everything lies a lesson. So when when advertising animals like you and me confront a, a large establishment which claims that there are rules of engagement and we turn around and say there are no rules of engagement because if there were rules of engagement everybody th everything would sound the same and everything would be pedantic. So, There's only one rule of engagement that I believed in and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah. It's engaging with the audience. Correct. And not That's only it. engaging with hmm. the tickling their, uh, uh, their, their, their imagination and challenging them to take the journey with you. 
so the moment you challenge an audience which is used to being spoon fed to turn around and and say yaar 2 2 plus 2 is not 4 uh, it's 22 and i'm giving you two you're giving me two now you come out with you come up with 22 because it's going to challenge you to uh, to 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 interpret then yeah, my, my brother called it very interestingly that yeah. you have to give the fill in the blanks to the audience correct so they participate so they participate and not only do they participate but they excel true and 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 they become one with the with with the with the message you know it's not a message anymore it's it's a message and the message then becomes a part of their journey and not your journey the the whole value adding uh, business is was my journey through life so i was shit scared of uh, boxing and i was uh, made to box because i said i do you sit to the girls or you box because men don't uh, not box so and if i are you know getting pulverized by a big bruiser in front of uh, uh, you know whole audience is not something that i would particularly enjoy so because i abhorred it so much and because i was so scared of it actually that boxing taught me how to face the fear yeah and not get paralyzed by it true so right through my life there have been moments of great fear which is why uh, 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 my boxing chapter is very detailed in its uh, development because th- that life lesson i've carried with me through my life which i if i was if i'm wrong please correct me mm. is that boxing lots of people believe is aggression yes. it's not aggression it's not it's, it's not aggression it is science it is preparation it is waiting waiting for the right opportunity, opportunity. and and creating the when right you have to yeah and creating the right opportunity i mean uh, all of us know about uh, that look at things which you didn't look at from that angle things turn out in life like sometimes people like us didn't know as to where your work is going to look at it, the last thing i don't think he imagined that one day a soldier would use the line ye dil mange mor yes that's the impact you leave on people at the time of writing it the, the the writer or the maker of the film prelal did not know that this is going to go this far this far and become so a part of what you said the line is challenging you used it and it probably made your day the day it was a sad day for the soldier yeah. but it uh, it must have been a great day that your line was ru- used in the right context it, and historically yeah you know also what uh, the, when when we got you know we were asked by pepsi uh, international as always like all international clients yeah that you translate this <coughs> and the tra- the line that they had was asked for, ask for more. more no i read about it yesterday what was the original line huh. it was asked for more asked for no, more a world of difference yeah you know asked for more what pepsi that's hmm. consumption true where is what anuja and and team went and made out of it asked for more what the heart wants from what the heart wants yeah asked for more from your heart yeah so you're not talking about pepsi now you're more talking about life and about yourself yes hmm. so the line became uh, huge i remember that be- hmm. be- because it became an anthem actually correct more than even a line correct you know, that you ask for more from life correct and so when we were making that film uh, such a mask film mm mm-hmm. i know, remember that and um, uh, they the the world cup sort of overtook the situation yeah and they said no no we have to get on to the world cup because mm. now we have no time and we have no money and we fought for that film because uh, we felt that there was merit in that idea of little kids wearing such a mask um uh, what do you call it uh, playing cricket under a tree in the tree in a, in a bus tree bare tree yeah. yeah and the 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 idea developed it was actually kids in a mask uh, i think the last shot makes the film not only When that he appears but himself no, but what kenny who directed the film for me kenneth dawson yeah um what he insisted on was that let's have busty kids and they were totally out of character yeah. because the busty kids don't can't afford coke or yeah. uh, pepsi sorry yeah you know that doesn't so, matter so it, it doesn't matter hmm. because at the end of the day uh, the argument 
from the client side to a certain extent was you are not our target audience. Yeah. So that's the uh, argument I've always had. Yes. Your target audience must love your ad. They don't want to be seen themselves. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I tried to get into Kenny's head as to why did he want the bus ticket. So he gave me a small insight which I used with Viva because she was mm -hmm. insisting I that, remember. Uh, that they, uh, we can't do this because they're not at our terms. My whole team will, uh, you know, uh, get up for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I told, I asked, I told her the same line that Kenny uh, told me, which is that whose is a bigger dream? A kid from a high rise who uh, drinks Pepsi, wants to be Sachin, but also wants to be lots of other things. And versus a child from a Basti who has nothing. I want to be Sachin. Fantastic. It's, it's a proper thing I'll add to it, Prahlad, uh -huh. is that when a kid from a building like this sees Pepsi talking to a busty guy, he yeah. feels great about Pepsi. Yes. So don't think that he's an idiot. idiot. He understands. I exactly. Mm. And the fact was that uh, uh, whose is the bigger dream? Yeah. And we're talking True. about dreams here, you know. So we were said that's not a fair question. So I told her, life is in favor. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. <laughs> <laughs> so, she backed us. You know, that I'll say for... Uh, no, she, she was a tough woman. She was an amazing woman. Mm. She backed the talk. Yeah. And she backed us to the hill. She said, Karo, and let's see what happens. And sure enough, Mr. Sinha, who was yeah, the I remember chair, chairman <laughs> of the thing, he said, yeah, oh, yeah, where have we got all these chokras from? You know? He, he and I had a history also, so I won't go into that. It's your book. We'll talk about yours. I have my own stories about him, which I'll share with you some other day. Some other day. <laughs> anyway, so the film became historical because I realized that at that time, that as long as Sachin is alive, that film will be relevant. It, it is all, see, good things always stay relevant. Mm. Uh, the Taj Mahal creators are not. Alive for alive. hundreds of years. Correct. But that thing is there. When you do something fantastic, and I think uh, the very fact that you use such an in a, such a charming way. Yes. For just two seconds. Two seconds, exactly. So which which is stays with people. So that was lovely. And uh, the the story the, the story behind that also. See, Sachin's uh, agency, which was uh, World Tel, mm. hated the script. <laughs> and See, when you do something beautiful. Uh, the people who go by the book hate the stuff. Yeah. So they hated the script. They didn't give it to him. And we were trying to get uh, to get a meeting with him to present the script to him. And they were uh, blocking us every yeah. time. So luckily for me, he lived you in the building. Know, I know. <laughs> so I uh, took a Sunday off and went up and down the lift the whole day, waiting to come. Found him. <laughs> some, 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 sometime he'll come down here. Yeah. So I found him and I narrated the script to him from the 15th floor to here. Mm. And he said, let's go. He said, sounds great. I'd say that much was Sachin. He sort of bought into it immediately. See, half the problem is that people who work as your managers huh. anticipate or try yeah, and exactly, second guess you. Exactly. And sometimes destroy some of the most beautiful ideas say, before it comes to you. The kettle is hotter or the tea. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So it was, so the, it became the imperative that I write about my growing up years. And my experiences in Dehradun and my Sani school. It's important because uh, that's what uh, tells people that no you are exposed to the world, yes. the chances of getting ideas are bigger and better. And, and Similarly, I want you to talk about um, why the restaurant, why the cigar thing, why you and I tasted tea once at the tea house. Correct. I called you for, yeah. uh, for yeah. a tasting session. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why those things which are out of your daily norm are the mind openers. And that's what I want to talk about. So, you know, because I lived such a varied uh, upbringing, you know, I was uh, the dancer of a general, but at the same time I had, I was in a military school, in a, in a science school, I didn't want to join the army because I was advised by General Chaudhary, who was then chief of staff. Mm. He said, son, I've seen your uh, bad data <laughs> and I've seen your thing, you are going to, if, if we were at war, Mm -hmm. If we, we just fought a war, so mm -hmm. I, it's unlikely that we're going to have another war. If we were at a wartime, uh, what do you call thing, you would uh, uh, you throw the book out of the window because that's what you do. 
and you would succeed beyond your imagination. wildest imagination. Mm. Because in you know in a war theatre, you're thinking of the seat of your pants. You're not following any book. But we are going to be in a peacetime, uh, what do you call it, army, and in a peacetime army which is spit and polish, you will be cashiered, one. cashiered for insubordination, <laughs> <laughs> with dishonour. True. So I suggest you don't join the army. And that's the best piece of advice I've ever I had. agree. You know? And in a military school, school captain. Yeah. You know? So, I followed his advice actually. Because yeah, I, I think sometimes when put like this. Yes. It makes sense. And this goes back to your advertising times and my advertising yes. times. When somebody says, this is the way it is, then you say, you can, you can go and take a jump. Uh, why? If somebody says, I'll tell you a story. Yes. Then you say, it, it makes sense. Makes sense. So, that, that's that, the beauty of it. And that's what you've been talking about, that a whole lot of people will go by the book, by the way things were done. Done. But magic happens when you undo them. Undo them. Absolutely. And you tell stories which are engaging, which you tell stories which are imaginative. Yeah. You tell stories because 2 plus 2 is equal to 22 and not 4. It's like they were not idiots um, thousands of years back. They, they wrote things like Doha's. One yes. line yes. gave you the interest, the other line gave you the meaning. Yes. One interest, one meaning. And you were saying, that's what advertising is all about. It's mm. actually storytelling. Yeah. And somehow we seem to have been in the last couple of years because we are so overtaken by technology that we don't understand that technology is only a vehicle. So true. It is not an end to itself. Technology is like any other technology. Yeah. Like I, I always keep saying that so artificial intelligence fine, but you need some real intelligence behind it. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely. We have to engage with young people today whose attention span is 5 seconds to 10 seconds. Then if you don't engage them with a story which, which affects them or uh, which inspires them in some manner or another, yeah. then there is no advertising. There is no advertising. There's, you have wasted your time. I See, advertising is a intrusion into people's life. True. And uh, if you are intruding, you better be good. And, and you, better, you, better be good. you better entertain them. Yeah, better entertain I always keep saying that if somebody knocks on my door as a salesperson, Yes. On a Sunday afternoon, when I've had two beers and good lunch, it better be somebody beautiful. Correct. <laughs> it better be somebody beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, so that's why the book became humongous. And we eventually thought of weaponizing it for ladies. Because it's thick enough to stop a bullet. <laughs> and it's heavy enough to, uh, for, <laughs> to hit somebody with it and they stay hit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's beautiful. And... And more the stories which are about life, I have loved them always and I am sure that people would love it. They have seen it. It's just that the scenarios in their life has said, yeah, if you do it like this, what will your neighbor think? Yes. If you do it like this, what will your mama think? Mama, think. mama and neighbor has no time for you. Let these people think. think. And what your book does is to allow people to think. Allow people to think about things which don't seem to matter, but they actually matter one hell of a lot in life. Absolutely. And um, so, because I started laughing, writing about my life and then my job, and then I, I, I wasn't only doing one job, I was doing multiple things because whatever interested me, you know, it's like uh, many years ago in college, uh, I had three girlfriends. And um, uh, people used to say, yeah, you're a, uh, what do you call, uh, Hanami, you, 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 you two-timing all three of them. But I was only two-timing them because I thought that I shouldn't tell them about each other. But I was wrong. <laughs> if I had told them about each other, they would have learned to live with it. <laughs> True. You know, it's just that they found out inadvertently together. Then you're completely stopped. Then they ganged up on me and screwed me. Ah, correct. Okay, so uh, I lost all three of them in one shot. But uh, the, my whole uh, thing to life is that if something really interests you or if something challenges you, why do you have to choose? True. So why do you have to choose between your so-called profession and between your hobby when your profession is your hobby? Correct. Absolutely, you don't have to. And if I look at all your work, it seems that you have enjoyed your work. Thoroughly. It doesn't seem huh. that you have 
you know, back to your brains about yeah. doing this, whether it's Khatak or whatever. Whatever. You are having a ball. And that's what I like about people, even younger people than you and me. Yeah. When they, when they do work like this, and you say, oh, this evening he's going to go and get pissed yeah. because he's done magic. Correct. So that's and if it's hmm. immersive. Hmm. Because it when is. you do work which 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 you which you enjoy thoroughly, it's immersive, like yeah. all hobbies. Hmm. So uh, scuba diving was a hobby which became a uh, semi-profession. Yeah. Uh, restauranting was cooking was a hobby which became uh, a semi-profession. Cigars were a hobby because I couldn't afford cigars, so I had to make my own. <laughs> you know, and so forth and so on. So everything that I added to the kitty was not because it was planned, not because it was to give me a better lifestyle or to uh, earn more money or whatever. It was just pure pleasure. Also, I, from the book, I want to share with all you people that uh, what Prilal's life and has captured in the book is that do not think that this person is not relevant to my life. If I go back and look at your association with Mr. Benegal, yes. And that lot, Mr. Benegal's films and your films have nothing to do with each other. Completely, we but we learn violently. <laughs> yeah. We learn from each other. Exposure to things which are not familiar, yes, or not in accordance with your thinking, is also a learning. Always, so I, I read in a number of places that you hung around with people whose lives were very different, but your interactions were very productive. Yeah, very productive. Mm. So, uh, Doctor Korean. Yeah. I mean, what more can you say? I mean, uh, he was like, we used to idolize him because yeah. he had such a tremendous sense of humor. He never took himself seriously. And right now we are going through this period, it's 102nd birthday. Yes. Hmm. And he would, the, the, he used to laugh at himself louder than he used to laugh at anybody hmm. else. And there's another thing for everyone to learn from that. Yes. If you want to make people laugh, learn to learn. Learn to laugh, laugh at, at yourself. yourself. Yeah, because if you take yourself hmm. too seriously, then you are. Then you become a, uh, then you become tiresome. Absolutely, you know, you become a pain in the ass mm. basically. You know. So that that's the book, and it's it's a it's not even chronological because I was influenced by a book called Dispatches, written by the uh, written on the Vietnam War by a journalist who wrote incidences in different theaters of the war, which were human interest stories. So they were not in order. Uh, so, so they were not like pele ye hua, fir wo hua. You know, no, don't there. have to. So it was it was standalone. Uh, what you oh, call this is what I liked about your book that yeah. you are switching from one this to that thing like yes. a human being does in their thinking style. Precisely. It doesn't have to be ah subah chhe baj ke. It's not a diary. Yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not timing. Mm. Then it's yeah. not chronology or anything of that Correct. sort. It depends on who's influenced what. You Correct. Know, at, at what time. So I was very influenced by that book, Dispatches, on the Vietnam War, because there were amazing human interest stories. Like there was one story where in Khesan, Khesan was a big battlefield in America, in in Vietnam, Vietnam, where the Americans had a big base in that valley, and what the Vietnamese, uh, the North Vietnamese did was they encircled the valley, and they put mortars. Mm. And every time the uh, the only way to supply the base was by air. Hmm. So they used to range onto the tarmac and they used to bomb uh, the hell out of the airfield to prevent the planes from actually supplying the troops. And the troops were, it, it was a forward area because they did all the patrolling out of there. So it was very important that the logistics was absolutely intact. But unlike Dien Bien Phu, where uh, the French were completely moribund uh, by the hills being surrounded by uh, General Ziap, here the Americans had uh, air power. They had artillery power, and they had uh, many ways to break the deadlock of of being surrounded. So they uh, see one North Vietnamese uh, soldier jumping into a foxhole, and they call in the artillery, and they bombard the hell out of the hill where there is nothing left, and then they think that Pagya, mm. and uh, and this guy suddenly pops up again and comes out of another tunnel yeah. somewhere else and then <laughs> dives into another tunnel. So they call in an airstrike. With napalm, and they napalm the hell out of that uh, mountain, and they, nothing ca is going to survive. And after everybody celebrating and saying "yeah," out he pops again, and runs in, dives into another foxhole. <clears throat> you know, here's the enemy. Every single GI 
on that outpost stood up and cheered. See, again, um, I want to share with the audience right now. Mm -hmm. So why are you telling these stories? See, within every kind of a problem, there is a solution. Whether it applies, he has given you a war analogy. It applies to life in every day. Yes. It uh, applies to any creative work that you are doing. It applies to problems that you may have in your house. It applies to everything that surrounds Correct. you. And that's the beauty of the book that, as I said earlier, use your common sense, read between the lines. There is an analogy which relates to everything in life. And you toast the survivor. Mm. Yeah. You toast the survivor. And since he's talking about war analogy, one of the other books that Prahlad, you must have read is a book called, called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. Correct. Which is Correct. also another of these things as to how to make teamwork happen. Yes. And he's made many teams happen. A number of good directors have first worked with Prahlad and then become big time directors. So there are a whole lot of stories of team building, of getting the best out of everyone, Everybody. of learning from life. And that's what I have to share with you. I think Prahlad can add as to what he wants. Just in case I miss something, Prahlad, <laughs> is all yours. It's been a journey. And finally, it also addressed the fact that there were a whole lot of new uh, generation kids on the block who said, how did they do this in that time? When there was no technology, <coughs> True. when there was no uh, digitalization, everything was done uh, the hard way. You know, yeah, there, there was no instant. It was a better way, actually. Yes, <laughs> there were no instant things. But the fact was that you latched onto a vision, and you just went for it, hammer and tongs, and didn't compromise the vision. It didn't. Uh, some of the uh, the more interesting people that we created out of the organization. And all of them were had were very different from each other. And I tried to capture their essences as much as possible. And said I've, that, I've seen the long section. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's called the clan. Yeah, the clan. And, uh, and uh, the fact is that there's, the, that there's an uh, element that holds everybody together because of common experience mm. and common goals and common achievements. You know, so the clan will survive me long after I have gone. That takes me to, we have hardly discussed a topic which I love talking about. Since you mentioned Tendulkar, I always say, uh -huh. when you talk about the clan, the clan is like a team. Yes. And I always say that alone, a Brian Lara also cannot win a match. match. So the clan is very important. Very and important. that's what that chapter, that long chapter covers as to what you can become if you have the right kind of people. They may be younger than you, but they are your great supports in thinking. They are your great supports in making it happen. Absolutely. That be right. And advertising is again uh, a very funny profession. It is a profession of the young. True. And the longer you remain young, regardless of your age, yeah. the, more, the more relevant you are. True. So, uh, in my office, I would teach people a discipline, I, I would teach them a craft. But they taught me how to be young. Thanks, Pralad. God bless you. Thank you. I'm waiting for your book. I two books. No, no. no. The Pandemon. Uh, Pandemonium, to you must uh, the, read. The second book I loved. Uh, the Open House. Uh, Pandemonium is what people have loved more. Uh, Pandemonium, they loved. But I like the second book more because... It because was, I addressed the, these people. No. There were insights. Because I asked them uh, questions. Yes. There were insights from you <coughs> which, which you actually panned out.